Hello, John Perry here. You are about to watch a clip from my conversation with Rob Stadler. Rob leans towards young earth creationism, and here I spoke about why it is that science tends to reject things like creationism and other supernatural claims that are similar. If you'd like to hear his rebuttal, there is a link down in the video description. Enjoy. I've been giving talks on science for a long time. This is one that I did back in 2012 on, you know, what, what is the nature of science? And I, I apologize if this feels a little bit juvenile, but this really is important to really understand this. Imagine you wake up in a giant castle filled with puzzle pieces. You know, you're, you're waist high in puzzle pieces. It's just a big mess, right? So this is kind of how scientists find themselves. If these puzzle pieces represent facts, observable facts, this is the world that we've woken up into. There's facts everywhere. There's observations we can make everywhere, but we don't really know automatically how to connect them together into a comprehensive picture. The first part of science really is to start just gathering the facts that we have around us. And scientific fields develop when people start collecting and classifying those observations. And this is, you know, the same thing you do when you're first starting to do a puzzle, is you, you kind of arrange things into different colors. And by the way, we're, we're assuming here that there is no, no key. There's, there's no picture to tell us what the puzzle's supposed to look like when it's done. And we have no, no clue how big it is. Maybe it goes on forever. We don't know. This is the situation that scientists find themselves in. There's all these observable facts we think maybe we can fit them together into a comprehensive picture. We don't know for sure, but we start collecting the facts. And if this collection and classification stage, this is where biology was in 1600s or whenever it was that Linnaeus started, started classifying things. People had been studying animals for a long time and plants and animals, but they didn't have a comprehensive theory as to what they were. You know, a lot of people worshiped animals. People thought that they were magic, all sorts of things that people thought. We were just collecting bits of information about them and loosely putting them together. No real theories. Then people started, you know, non-scientists, just people started putting things together. You know, you start having animals in a zoo, right? You start keeping them. It starts out as a freak show. You're just really interested in keeping tigers because they're scary. And then you start to piece things together. You know, you start to figure out their diet. You start to think of them as organisms that are trying to survive in the wild instead of these mythical beasts. You start to realize that they, they're not just monsters. They can actually form strong social bonds when they're well fed <laughs> with each other. And they can form even strong social bonds with, with people and other animals. So you're just, you do this casual theory building. You know, there's a, a lot of times we talk about scientific theories and this is, this is different than that. Casual theory building, you're just kind of putting some pieces together. From there, you can actually get a real scientific research program to be kickstarted. And what you do there is you start using the, the picture that you have so far, this foundational theory that has been developed, and you start to make testable hypotheses. And this is what uh, Lakatos, that one of the scientific philosophers talks about, the theoretical core of a research program. So a, a, an actual scientific research program. So you've got the core, which is the picture that's already been built. And then you have the hypotheses which have been drawn. And those hypotheses can guide you to go find the missing pieces of this puzzle and really start to, to put this together. And the theoretical core of a research program, he says, is not actually tested by the scientists that are working in the research program. Instead, they're using that core to make hypotheses, testable hypotheses. And then they go out and they, they they test those hypotheses. They go on expeditions to find the facts that they, that they think should exist. They design experiments to test different things to find facts that they think should exist. And if the theoretical core is good, what's going to happen is that the, some of the hypotheses, maybe not all of them, but some of the hypotheses that we form are going to lead to new discoveries. Or they're going to help us find places for the facts that we've already found that we didn't know where to, where to put. As you can see on, this, on my screen here, there's a bunch of other puzzle pieces already here. Puzzle pieces we think should belong to this, this uh, theoretical core, but we're not sure where to put them. Well, this, this can help us make sense of the facts that we already have, and it can help us go find brand new facts. Karl Popper talked about how theories need to be falsifiable. Lakatos comes after Popper and he says, well, that's actually not how science usually works. Usually people working in a specific theory, they're not actually trying to test their theory. They're only testing hypothesis that they've drawn from the theory. And the way that you actually test theories, like the foundational theories that people are basing their research programs on, is you have competing research programs with competing theories. So I have here, I've got puzzle pieces that are arranged differently. So you've got different foundational theories here. And the, you're using those to create different hypotheses. And the two research programs, the two, the two foundational theories are competing against each other to see which one ends up leading to more discoveries. And so the one on the right here um, that assumes that this is a, a, a breakfast plate with a fork is going to end up doing better than the one that thinks that it's a spoon. Because why, why would you eat crepes with a spoon, right? So this is how competing research programs give credence to one theory over another. The goal in science is to come closer to an understanding of, of reality, but truth is extremely hard to discern. 
And so our goal is to, is to approach it the best we can. That's what scientists are doing. They're trying to create models that are more and more accurate as time goes on. And they do this by the, having these competing research programs and so on. During the Black Plague, there were three big theories, you could say. They were pretty casual theories. But three big competing ideas about what was causing the Black Plague. Most people in the early, in the early years of the Black Plague, the Black Plague kept on happening for like 300 years. It would just keep happening. It was horrible. And it would just devastate populations. And what most people thought is that it, it was a supernatural event and it was a curse from God. And this was the vast majority of people. This is what was being taught everywhere. And so people who believed that theory, they were trying to combat the, the disease by preaching repentance. Some people looked to the Bible for ideas as to how you could atone for the sins of your city. And so they started beating themselves. I don't know how you get that from the Bible. Jesus didn't beat himself, right? But uh, they thought that by beating themselves, they would whip themselves in the city. They'd walk through the towns and, and whip themselves till they're bleeding, till their bones are exposed. It was absolutely horrible. But they, would, they were trying to atone for the sins of the city and, and make the plague go away. You had all sorts of, of things going on, different hypotheses that people were testing. Was everybody getting affected the same or, or were, were really bad sinners being affected more than, you know, religious people? And nothing was really panning out. All of the hypotheses tested there, they failed. The second big theory, which was really horrible, is they thought that, that immigrants were poisoning the well. And to test that hypothesis, they killed thousands of immigrants they would slaughter them. It was absolutely a horrible way to uh, test that hypothesis, but that's what they were doing, and that did nothing. The third big idea that people had is that the disease was caused by bad air. This is called miasma theory, or miasma theory. To test this hypothesis, they would wear a lot of perfume, so if you can't smell the bad air, maybe you won't get sick. That didn't work. Uh, sometimes they would wear masks. That actually did work fairly well. If you're wearing a mask, you're less likely to get the plague. And eventually people started doing quarantines when plagues broke out, and they did the quarantines to avoid breathing the bad air. This worked. This eventually became the scientific theory of the day. Miasma theory was the explanation for the plague. So bad, stale air caused the plague. That's what people thought at the time. And that was a really good theory, producing a lot of good testable hypotheses. And it was an established scientific theory in its day. This is what people typically talk about when, they, when they're talking about scientific theories. An established scientific theory, something like germ theory today, the uh, theory of gravity, the theory of evolution. An established scientific theory, it, it might not be correct, completely correct, or it actually might be far from the truth, but it keeps leading us to testable hypotheses that, that are leading us to new discoveries. So miasma theory was the one that eventually won out here during the Black Plague. But then in the, in the 1600s, we realized that, that germs exist. Anthony von Leeuwenhoek, he discovered the microorganisms in his microscopes. And this was absolutely amazing. This was a huge breakthrough. We developed germ theory from this discovery. And germ theory was amazing because it described it, it made sense of all the stuff that miasma theory was, was giving us. You didn't have to ruin anything, any of the actual facts in miasma theory. They were explained with this new theory. But it also gave us a whole bunch of more understanding, a much, much larger picture. You know, bacteria cause smells, bad smells sometimes. Some of them do. Some bacteria can travel through the air. And so the quarantine, the mask wearing, all that stuff worked, not because bad air was the cause of the, of the disease, but because bacteria were the cause of the disease. And the air was one way in which those bacteria were spreading. They were also spreading through ticks and, or through uh, fleas and, and rats and so on. So this was a huge breakthrough. And this theory replaced the old theory. This is how, if, if you don't like a theory, like you don't like the, the current theory of the origin of life, the only thing you have to do to replace that theory with a different theory is come up with a better one that is leading us to more discoveries more quickly, more consistently. And you will have people who won't accept it for personal reasons, but people with money that fund science, they're going to they're gonna fund things that work. That's what they care about. What works? They fund those things. Eventually you'll see, even if people have to drag their feet, you'll see the scientific community come over to, sometimes it might take a generation, but you will see if you come up with a better theory that consistently leads to more discoveries on a regular basis than the mainstream theory, the main scientific theory of the time, it will topple the old. It will cause what some people call a paradigm shift in science. Research programs based on different theories become more progressive and they replace the old theory. And so now we have germ theory replacing miasma. Both were scientific, both were good theories in their day. This is <laughs> my, <laughs> my depiction of origin of life science right now. There's a lot of question marks. There's a lot of little bubbles that we think we've figured out, little, little pockets that we think we understand quite well. And there's huge gaps and huge questions. And there's all sorts of puzzle pieces that we think need to be explained by our theory that are not yet explained by our theory. We're in the very early stages of solving this jigsaw puzzle, right? And you, know, you might even argue that this isn't uh, a good enough depiction here. I should have more gaps and more. What I would argue is that every day, because we're learning more about what is required for the 
simplest of cells. Every day, another 100 puzzle pieces are being tossed onto the plate here, meaning that the, the goal of trying to understand a natural approach to origin of life, that goal is pulling away from us exponentially over time. And that's why it's not a progressive research program. It's degenerate. It's actually losing ground day by day as we learn more about cells. Yeah, so what you're, what you're saying is that collecting facts that we think should apply to this theory is bad for the theory. But I don't know if you've ever done a puzzle before, <laughs> but figuring out, finding the puzzle pieces that you think belong to the puzzle. Like, let's say you've got like 10 puzzles mixed together. And that's actually what happens in science. You, the, everything's actually mixed together. What I talked about with the bird earlier, you'll find pieces, you think that the theory of gravity needs to explain the bird. But in reality, that, that anomaly is explained by a different theory. You, you need to understand how air pressure works, aerodynamics. And so when we're collecting all these puzzle pieces, we, you are correct. We have a whole bunch of new puzzle pieces that keep getting added to this. And we think that our theory needs to explain them. We're not sure, though. We think that our theory needs to explain all of them. We can't tell. We might find that our theory, that a bunch of them are explained by something else. In your book and in our last conversation, you, you're saying that origin of life research needs to explain how you get from simple chemicals to an entire cell with like 500 genes or 400 genes or whatever that was. Origin of life researchers are now convinced that that's not the case. What, what we need to get to is a self-replicating molecule or self-replicating chemical system that can undergo Darwinian style evolution. So descent with modification acted upon by selection. I mean, eventually we do want to show how we connect these early replicating molecules all the way to cells. So we will... Well, that, that, that I would say is essential. I mean, people who are stumped by the process and find they're not making progress, one approach is to try to define the problem differently to make it simpler. And so they try to push away the complexity of getting to a self-replicating cell. They push that away and say, all I need is a tiny little molecule that can reproduce itself. Well, again, if you that's, ever, not, that's not solving the real problem. Have you ever done a jigsaw puzzle? Yeah. If, if you're doing a 10,000 piece puzzle, <laughs> if you keep worrying about all the pieces and you get so stressed out that you give up, you're never gonna finish. You have to start with where you have headway. And, and this is what origin of life researchers are doing. So you talked about having competing hypotheses and in, in the big picture of origin of life research, you have the hypothesis that it happened naturally yeah. And no alternative hypotheses are allowed to be considered. That is that's false. The, that's the way it is. If anyone has another research program founded on a completely different idea that is more progressive than this research Internet. program, it will win. It will. All you have to do is actually do the research. That's it. You actually have well, to do the work. You can't say, oh, what you're doing is hard, therefore it was God. That's, you need to show how God did it. Let's show us what God is. Explain what yeah, God that, is. Create a research that, program based on that and show us. So what, what I'm about to show you is what, is what a lot of kind of the classic American young earth creationists have done. This is how they solve puzzles. <laughs> they, just, they just tie everything as a miracle. Each individual piece of data is just a miracle tied to God. This tells us nothing. The interesting thing about this is that it, it's, a, it's a perfect explanation. You can use God to explain anything. So you have, you have a perfect explanation for all the facts that exist, but there is no understanding that comes along with this. This slide is what I, what I call Ken Ham solved a jigsaw puzzle in record time. And this is what we see with conspiracy theories as well. There's, we, we talked about this one that uh, David Icke is, is, has been writing about, that there are, there's a species of reptilian organisms that are shapeshifters that control the government. And according to political surveys, 12 million Americans believe that this is true. I don't, I don't trust that survey, but I, I know that there, are, there is a healthy chunk of people that believe this is true uh, because I, I get emails from them. So I've also, I've also heard that five out of four people don't understand how fractions work. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I get emails from these people from time to time. They tell me that um, there's a different species, uh, there's a different race and they're shapeshifters and they're controlling everything. And the crazy, the, the funny thing about this is that you say, okay, well, what's the evidence of this? And they say, oh, so-and-so is acting really weird. I'm like, well, yeah, but so-and-so like Hillary Clinton, for example, Hillary Clinton does all these weird things. Yeah. But she also does all these, these regular things. And like, well, that's when she's pretending to be human. <laughs> and we, so when she's, <laughs> When she's being normal, she's pretending to be human, and she's doing a good job at it. When she's acting bizarre, she's, her reptilian is coming out. And so it's, it explains everything. It does explain everything perfectly, but it gives us no actual right. understanding. And this is, this is what I see with the current, a lot of the current uh, supernatural claims. Like, if, if we don't actually know how it works piece by piece, just put a question mark there. We don't, we don't know what the cause is. There might be a bunch of other things we just don't know about Hillary Clinton that makes her act, act weird sometimes. She might not be a reptile. <laughs> she might just be a human who's stressed.